Hello everyone, Foxy here, and welcome to Mostly Mental. Today, I'd like to take a sphere, disassemble it into pieces, and then put those pieces back together to make two spheres of the original size. That sounds impossible without sleight of hand, but using infinite sets, a bit of algebra, and the axiom of choice, we'll be able to pull it off. It's a result known as the Banach-Tarski paradox. First, let's look at a simpler problem to build some intuition. Let's say we have a line, like so, with one point missing. Is there some way to break what's left into pieces and rearrange them to somehow cover that hole so we end up with a solid line when we're done? Well, we could take a point from somewhere over here and move it to fill the hole, but that creates a hole over here. And we could take another point to fill in that hole, but that point's got to come from somewhere, and so that'll leave a hole too. So this is impossible, right? We're always going to end up with another hole somewhere? Well, not quite. It can't be done with a finite number of points, but it can be done. We can take a set of points that are spaced one unit apart up here and shift each of them over to the left by one unit to fill in the holes down here. Now, you may be wondering, what about the last point? Surely there's going to be a hole somewhere. And that's why it's so important that we go on forever. There is no last point. For any point on this line that we end up with, we can say where the point that fills it came from. If it's one of the red points, then it just came from the same spot on the line above. And if it's one of the black points, then it came from one unit over to its right. And so we can account for every point on this line. So there can't be any holes when we're done. For our Banach-Tarski construction, we'll be covering more than just a single missing point, but it's the same basic idea. We're taking an infinite set and moving it so that it covers the same points plus a little bit more. To fill in the details, we'll need to take a detour through abstract algebra. Suppose we have four letters, A, A inverse, B, and B inverse. And we have the rule that any time A and A inverse, or B and B inverse, are next to each other in a word, they cancel out. So, for example, the word A inverse, B, 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 A inverse, a, B, inverse, A, will be equivalent to A inverse, B, 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 B inverse, A, since the A inverse and A cancel. And then we can cancel again with this B and B inverse to get A inverse, B, B, A. And we can't cancel this any further, even though there's an A inverse and an A, because there are some letters in between. Then the group of words that we can make with these letters and this cancellation rule is known as the free group on A and B. So what words can we make? Well, once all the cancellation happens, some of our words will start with A. We'll call this set of words S of A. And similarly, some will start with A inverse, and some will start with B, and some will start with B inverse. And for completeness, there's one more word, the word with no letters in it, which is what you get when you cancel A and A inverse. We'll call this the empty string and write it with an epsilon. So the free group on A and B will be the union of all of these sets. Okay, so what does a word in S of A look like? Well, the first letter is always going to be an A. How about the second letter? It could be another A, or it could be a B, or it could be a B inverse. 
or if the word is just A, there could be no second letter. But it can never be an A inverse, since then it would cancel, and in defining these, we said that we've already done our cancellation. So a word in S of A will be an A followed by a word starting with A, or an A followed by a word starting with B, or an A followed by a word starting with B inverse, or just the word A. And now we've got a lot of leading A's, so let's cancel that out. Let's put an A inverse in front, and that gives us A inverse A, S of A, which is just S of A, and S of B, S of B inverse, and the empty string. Well, that looks a lot like the free group we defined up here. We've got S of A, and we've got all of these terms. All that's missing is this S of A inverse. So if we add that into both sides, S of A inverse, union, A inverse, S of A, that's going to give us this plus S of A inverse, which is the free group. Wait, hang on. That means that using only two of our subsets, S of A inverse and S of A, and a little bit of transformation with this A inverse here, we've managed to create the whole free group. And we can do the same thing using S of B inverse and B inverse S of B. So using our four sets here, that is, the parts that we've broken the free group into, we've managed to assemble two copies of the free group. That's starting to sound a lot like Banach Tarski. Now let's translate this algebra into geometry. We'll take a sphere and pick two axes passing through the center. We'll call a rotation by some fixed amount around this first axis. A, and a rotation by the same amount in the opposite direction, A inverse. And similarly, rotations by the same amount around the other axis will be B and B inverse. Then a word made up of these four letters will correspond to a series of rotations reading off from right to left. So, for example, B inverse A, B means first rotate by B, then rotate by A, and then rotate by B inverse. It's a little tricky to follow the whole sphere, so let's just look at what happens to a single point. So if we first rotate by B, and then rotate by A, and then rotate by B inverse, we'll end up with some point around here. And if we wanted to get back to our starting point, we could rotate from B by B inverse, which would give us B inverse B, which corresponds to the empty string. And so any string made up of these four letters will correspond to a point that the empty string point here can be rotated onto using a series of these four rotations. And if we choose our angles and axes carefully, we can make sure that we never hit the same point twice, that every possible word will correspond to a different point on the sphere. We won't hit every point, I'll get back to that in a minute, but we will hit infinitely many points along the way. And importantly, since there are no repeated points, this group of rotations of these four elements has the same structure as the free group on A and B. That is, they're isomorphic. 
And what that means is that we can apply the same construction that we saw earlier to these rotations. We can take the set of points where the first letter is A, and that corresponds to points where the last rotation is around the A axis, and then rotate each of those points by A inverse. And then if we add in all of the points where the first letter is A inverse, that'll give us a copy of our set of points. And if we do the same thing with B and B inverse, we'll get a second copy. So just by splitting the points into four sets and rotating some of them, we've managed to get two copies of our points. That is, we've duplicated the points on the sphere. That's most of the work done, but there's still one last step we need. We didn't hit every point on the sphere, only the points we could reach with our four rotations, which is known as the orbit of our starting point. And in fact, all of these red points that we hit will have the same orbit, so it's really the orbit of the group. But there's still a lot of points in here that we didn't hit. And in order to fix that, we'll need to look at other orbits. So if we choose, for example, some starting point over here, that'll give us an orbit which never overlaps with our red orbit. All of the points will be different. And in fact, every point on the sphere will belong to exactly one orbit. The orbits partition the sphere. So all we need to do is to pick one point from each orbit to be our starting point. And then we can duplicate all of those orbits at once using the same rotations. So we've managed to cut up our whole sphere and rotate some of the parts to get two spheres. That is Banach Tarski. That last step, where we chose a starting point from each orbit, isn't quite as simple as I made it sound. To do that, we need to assume something called the axiom of choice, which says that if you have a collection of sets, possibly infinite, you can choose one element from each of them. That sounds fairly innocent, but it has some weird consequences, like, for example, reassembling one sphere into two. So some people point at banach tarski as a reason to totally dismiss the axiom of choice. And in fact, you can build an equally consistent version of math where the axiom of choice is false. Except the weirdness in this proof didn't come from the axiom of choice. Yes, we used choice in this last step, where we went from one orbit to the whole sphere, but before that, we had already managed to copy an orbit just by rearranging its parts. That weirdness came from the tricks we did with infinite sets. And infinity is intrinsic to mathematics. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you again soon.